I do believe that naturally our body is designed to fast. I think somewhere along the line we lost critical thinking. How do the foods we eat either slow down or accelerate aging? And how is that linked with the kind of chronic inflammation we're told we need to address if we want to age well? With so many different schools of thought around good and bad foods to eat, what are some simple rules for supporting our health long term through diet? And what are some of the signs beyond weight gain that we might not be getting that balance quite right? Well, here to answer all of those questions and more is my guest today, Fiona Tuck. She's a nutritional medicine practitioner and author of Forensic Nutritionist, an investigative approach into health and well-being. And she joins me today to share her no-nonsense and straightforward advice about what to eat to beat chronic inflammation and the food myths holding us back. Fiona, welcome to the channel. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you, Claire, because I think we're both very aligned in what we research and what we believe in and yeah. our philosophy towards, you know, skincare and aging. So I'm really keen to see where this takes us today. 100% agree. I was just thinking we're so many miles apart because it's 8.30 a.m. for me in the UK, 5.30 p.m. for you in Australia. You were sitting there in the the pitch dark outside and I'm in, I'm in the light, but we have so much in common. Nutrition and skin health, of course, being two of the big things there. I mean, how have those two things come together for you professionally? So I've been in the skincare industry for, it's over 30 years um, working in the professional skincare industry. And I've, you know, I've been hands-on um, skin therapist. I've been an educator. I've I've also worked in product development and formulation. Um, but for me, working with people and working on skin and with skin, I saw that there was a missing link. You know, we can put on the good skincare and we can take care of our skin, but often that wasn't enough. I mean, we could get good skin and great results from topical skincare and professional skin treatments. But quite often, you know, people weren't looking after their skin at home by what I would think is important skincare, which is lifestyle, you know, nutrition, looking after their diet and um, looking after their skin in that way. Because I do believe that your skin does reflect what you put inside it. You Absolutely. Know, our skin cells are ultimately made up of what we eat. If you think about it in a very basic way, when you're working with skin conditions, particularly um, inflammatory skin conditions, I really feel that you do have to look at things like gut health. You have to look at what people are putting into their body, their lifestyle factors, alcohol consumption, sleep, stress levels, all of those things. So for me, the natural progression was to then go on and also study nutritional medicine. Mm. So I could marry nutrition and topical skincare. And for me, when you can do that, um, that's when you can get, you know, good skin into really great skin. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a lover of detail and I am intrigued by how you describe yourself as a forensic nutritionist. I love that. But what does that involve? It's just a term really, um, just to differentiate. And I did write a book which was called mm. The Forensic Nutritionist back in 2016. Um, so that's really where the term um, The Forensic Nutritionist came from. For me, I'm all about trying to find the root cause. And that's why we sort of came up with the word forensic nutritionist. Mm. And I'm also very much about looking at somebody's face, looking at their skin, looking at their body, and trying to get clues. Because I do think that, you know, looking at the fingernails, looking at the hair, looking at the skin, even the tongue, it can all give mm. us a really good indication of what may be going on internally or possible nutritional deficiencies. I'm always looking at the the whole person and trying to think, oh, you know, what are your eyebrows like? Because looking at the eyebrows can sometimes give us an indication of thyroid health, for instance. Mm. So you've got to be really sort of tuned in and you might have a wrinkle on your face because that's the way you sleep and it might be down to aging or it might be signifying something else. So it's about asking the right questions and just looking at the face and the body to help you with your um, your investigation. And I guess that's where the, the forensic side comes in. And obviously you need to back that up with pathology testing as well. Yeah, um, 
And I'm interested in those warning signs that we might have suboptimal levels of nutrition. I know that's something you talk about in the book. Um, what are some of the key warning signs? I mean, you mentioned eyebrows there, which is of interest to me, and I know it will be for a lot of people watching or listening. I mean, I had mine sort of tattooed in, microbladed in, but I have very thin eyebrows on the outer side. Is that thyroid health? Yes, it can be. And obviously you'd back that up by texting, but it mm. might just be, okay, let's, I'd ask you more questions. So when we start to see thinning of the eyebrow hair, from, from this point out, or loss of eyebrow hair even, that can be an indication, first of all, of um, adrenals. So um, adrenal gland exhaustion, adrenal fatigue, so basically chronic stress levels, mm -hmm. which can also um, have an effect on your thyroid because the adrenal glands and the the health of the adrenal glands, which are the glands that sit on top of your kidneys that produce um, your stress hormones, and, you know, post-menopause, they can be in, involved in sort of um, hormone production for women as well. They are very closely linked with your thyroid health as well. But quite often when we've lost that outer eyebrow hair, it could be a sign of underactive thyroid or early warning signs of that. So um, just little things like that. I'd also be asking about carbohydrate consumption because if somebody's on a chronically low carbohydrate diet, um, which I do see a lot of women, you know, cutting out yep. the carbs, you know, no carbs before marbs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, you know, oh, they won't have potatoes and they won't have rice and they won't have bread and really chronically on a low carb diet, that can actually put stress on the adre adrenal glands too, that can raise cortisol levels and it can have long term effects on negatively impacting the thyroid gland as well. So mm making sure we're getting enough carbohydrates in the diet is really important for women's health. And a lot of women that really have these low carb diets, you will find, you know, their adrenal health suffers, their thyroid health suffers, and they're, they're chronically exhausted and tired. And then they're leaning to the caffeine and alcohol and sugar fixes and binge eating and that type of thing as well. So, um, the face can tell us a lot. Yeah, and I mean, that's an interesting one. And I do want to come on to uh, some of the kind of dietary theories that are swimming around at the moment, because we hear a lot about cut out carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are evil. I mean, I can't, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just too hungry to, to cut them out. So, you know, I go for the whole grains, those kind of things. But I, w I want to come back to that with you. I'm just interested while we're on the topic of what are some of the other warning signs that we should look out for? You mentioned the tongue. Well, it depends. Obviously, there can be a lot of different things going on, um, but, but sometimes it can be different markings on the tongue, can be signs of um, digestive health. It mm. can be, you know, if you've got a coating on the tongue, mm. again, it can be signs of um, things going on with your digestion. It can be signs of energy levels as well. So um, it could just be teeth marking on the tongue or it can be a scalloped edged tongue there's, there's a lot of different things particularly um tongue diagnosis used to be used a lot in asian or eastern medicine and even if you think about western medicine the doctor always used to look at the tongue but just doesn't happen these days and skin and nails um what do they tell us when you've got the, the dry brittle nails maybe drier skin what could that point to? Lots of different things. But for instance, brittle nails, it could be a sign of a mineral deficiency. It could be calcium. It could be iron. You know, you'd need to do more investigations yeah. and ask more questions. Um, if you've got almost spoon-shaped nails, so when the top of the nail sort of curves downward slightly, that can be a sign of low chronic low iron um, because it will affect how the nail grows. Also, the colour of the skin, if you're very pale, that could be a sign that someone is prone to an iron deficiency or low iron. Um, so the nails, ridged nails as well, sometimes that can be a sign of poor digestion or digestive health. And, you know, pitting of the nails could be a sign of an autoimmune disorder or psoriasis on the skin. Um, quite often people that suffer 
from psoriasis quite significantly, you'll see pitting of the nails, which is a sign of um, autoimmune disease. And so this is really where you start with your clients is, is going through all that and, and piecing together the factors. Um, I'd like to ask about how this ties into the concept of inflammaging, that term that I hear a lot. Um, it's certainly a, a big buzzword. It's used, I think, to describe chronic inflammation, that kind of ongoing inflammation that can accelerate some of the negative aspects of aging, like disease being an obvious one. So that's how the, the term inflammaging is kind of potted together. What are the kind of primary causes um, linked to, to lifestyle of chronic inflammation? So chronic inflammation is something that is going to happen with aging to a certain degree. And I think about you know, 20 years ago or so, um, the term inflammaging mm. was, was coined. And it really is referring to, quite rightly, as you said, this chronic low-grade inflammation that occurs systemically throughout the body as we age. Now, the more inflammation that we have, the higher our inflammatory markers, the more that seems to accelerate the aging process and is linked with disease. Now, when you think about any disease, really, it all stems from inflammation. Um, so the higher levels of inflammation that you have, the more prone you're going to be to, I would say, accelerated aging or um, disease within the body. Now, that could be something such as type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome that is all related to inflammation. It could be brain health, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, those types of things as well, heart disease, fatty liver. So there's a lot of different diseases that would be linked to inflammation and just general aging as well. We're all going to be exposed to it. So it's not something that you can completely prevent. Mm. But life, lifestyle factors and, you know, our, our lifestyle, our diet, our stress levels, all of these things will influence, in a way, the systemic inflammation of the body, even our gut health as well. So yeah. it, it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg situation because the more inflammation we have, the more inflammation it will create. You know, naturally with age, we start to see a dysregulation of the immune system. So as we age and things start degenerating and breaking down, sort of those metabolites, if you like, in the body, the immune system will then start to recognise them differently, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, because the immune system is dysregulated. The immune system ages as well. I guess when we're younger, the immune system responds differently to as we age. And so what can then happen is when we have this dysregulated immune system, we also can then start to see more inflammatory mediators being produced. And we've got this sort of bit of a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. We can also see things such as um, mitochondria dysfunction, and that's when the little energy producing cells start to dis decline. Um, we can also see something that is called cellular senescence. I'm not sure if you've heard of that. I have heard of that. Yeah, particularly in relation to skin, actually, which is often what I'm speaking to yes. people about, but that's throughout the body. Yes. And it's very much talked about in skin, inflammaging and cellular senescence. And that is... And is that the dying of... Or, or, well, you explain that for us. You'll do a lot better. So normally with... Um, with your cells, wherever they are in the body, you know, when we when we get wear and tear, the cellular processes, if you like, are able to come in and clean up any debris in the cell. Mm. The best way I can describe it would be if you imagine you have a fish tank and that fish tank creates debris and instead of beautiful, clear water, you've got sort of murky, muddy water in the fish tank because basically the pump is not working efficiently to, to cleanse out the fish tank. When um, our cells are working properly, if we get sort of damage or, you know, DNA damage or um, debris in the cell, the cell is able to go through a process of what we call autophagy and it can clean out the cell and get rid of any 
damage. Eventually, though, um, if enough damage occurs, then the cell will go through something that is called apoptosis. So basically the cell will be removed and die off, you know, and, and we're mm -hmm. fine. You know, that's how we prevent things like cancers and diseases and um, DNA mutations. We just get rid of the, the cell. And that happens in a, a healthy body and when we're younger and we need, you know, certain lifestyle factors and diets to help that process as well. Now, when that doesn't occur properly, the cells go into what we call cellular senescence. So they haven't been um, removed, they haven't been got rid of, and they're just hanging around as inactive zombie cells, basically. And what will happen is these zombie cells then will increase more pro-inflammatory mediators because the body or the, or the cells surrounding are like, hey, what's going on here? You know, this, this is something that shouldn't be there and it creates more of a burden, if you like, on the immune system and on the inflammatory process. That is also going to then impact inflammaging. I'm guessing the lifestyle um, can, can help um, improve um, our cell efficiency to try and deal with that. But as we age, there's always going to be, that, that's always going to be an issue for us as we age, but we're looking to kind of uh, improve and slow, slow down those senescent cells. Is that, is that right? Absolutely. So as, we, um, as we're aging, obviously we're going to get wear and tear, but it's a bit like, you know, if you're driving a car at 100 miles an hour all the time, you're going to wear that car out a lot faster. So if we're stressed out, we're, we're burning the candle at both ends, we're not putting the right fuel in our bodies, we're going to wear out a lot quicker and going to put a lot more stress on our bodies. And if we don't have the right nutrients to support that, then the body can't defend itself. So we know, for instance, that a whole food diet, a diet that is rich in plant compounds, not only do the plant compounds provide really important prebiotics for the gut, fibres, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, um, polyphenols, they're providing this array of what we call phytonutrients or phytochemicals. And these phytochemicals that are present in plant foods help to activate um, certain transcription factors in the body that allow the cells to produce their own antioxidants. So things like glutathione um, that diminishes or diminishes with, with age. But we need to be getting the right nutrients into our cells to be able to activate our body's own natural cellular defense mechanisms. And so if we're not doing that over time, we just don't have the ammunition to um, help to support ourselves. So we know um, getting the right nutrients helps to activate a process called NRF2 activation, which is a transcription factor that regulates over you know, hundreds of different genes in the body that will help to um, downregulate inflammation within the body to so keep our infl inflammatory levels under control. Um, it can help to upregulate our own antioxidant production. It can also help with the process of autophagy, which is what I was talking about earlier, you know, helping to clear out the debris of the cells. Also, we know things like exercise can help to do that, providing you're not over exercising, mm -hmm. but you are exercising. And that's one of the reasons that we say, you know, sitting is the new smoking. We need to exercise to help to upregulate these, um, in a way, longevity genes and lower inflammation within the body and help to clear out the, the debris cells. We also know that intermittent fasting can also help to, when done correctly, mind you, because a lot of people don't do it correctly, can also help to help with that process of autophagy and clearing out the cellular debris. So that is why yeah. it is linked with longevity as well. And intermittent fasting is an interesting one because I've seen a lot of conflicting studies around that. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're talking about doing it right, what does that look like for you? I'm a big believer in not making anything trendy, right? So I do believe that intermittent fasting has become trendy. You know, it's another thing to sell a book or it's another thing to people get obsessed with. Mm -hmm. And really, I do believe that naturally our body is designed to fast, you know, and that is what 
breakfast is, you know, it's breaking mm-hmm. the fast. So if we have dinner ideally around six o'clock at night and then you're not eating breakfast until sort of nine o'clock the next day, your body has gone through a fast. Mm-hmm. And we need to go through that period for rest and repair within the body. And that's really what fasting is is, is for. That's yeah. why we're meant to have a period where we don't eat. 14 hours, 12 to 14 hours is a good period of time to go without food. But if somebody is sort of looking at the clock and checking every minute and I can't go out for breakfast until 12 o'clock because I've got to fast and then they just eat whatever they want and they're not getting enough nutrients in or they're just sort of eating absolutely anything um, and then just only eating in a certain window, they may, they're they not necessarily going to be getting the benefits of, of the fasting. I think people are overthinking it. And if you just have dinner early and have breakfast a little bit later, that's really all there is to it. Yeah, no, I'm glad I'm glad you said that actually, because um missing full days of eating is it's just something I can't really get on board with. I know some people do it and they feel it works for them. Yeah. Um but yeah, naturally that's just how my eating patterns have evolved, is that you know, I'll yeah. I don't eat after dinner and then you know, I'll, I'll eat when I feel hungry in the morning, which is typically about between 12 and 14 hours later, actually. I think yeah. think your digestive system, that's, for a lot of people, that's the natural pattern if you, if you just go with it. I think we're probably quite aligned on diet as well. And the, mm-hmm. what, what I've come to over the years of interviewing people and reading and watching experts talk about this, and you know, I will he- hear different people with their different schools of thought and my head is left swimming every time and where I landed was if I am not eating a lot of processed food and if I am not drinking sugary drinks very regularly at all or sweetened drinks you know I'm I'm having my water I have a largely whole food based diet I cook my meals from scratch you know um, but yeah, I have chocolate most days, that kind of thing. I have my treats, I'm not perfect. Um, But that's really the basis of my diet, it's mainly a whole food diet. I do not sweat the fact that I eat whole oats with my breakfast every morning, you know, um, and I have every different type of nut and I'm not over analyzing those whole foods. I just eat the whole foods I want to eat and I try and keep them as varied as possible eat as many plants as I can, so throw in some herbs and that kind of thing. Um, But I don't get tied up on it because I know that it's just going to end up throwing me completely off track. And so basically that is, that is usually my message to people is don't listen to all the noise and the people that say plants are toxic for you and all the rest of it. I mean, when you go to extremes, that's when the trouble starts, in my own experience from what I've seen. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you, is, that where, is that where you pretty much land or are there some things you think that we should be looking to, to cut out? No, that's exactly where I land. So oh, this good. is why I, I love what you say and what, what you're doing because there's too many messages out there <laughs> that are scaremongering. And, you know, people say, don't eat that. It's got lectins in it. Don't eat that because it's carcinogenic. Don't eat that because it's got heavy metals in it. Don't eat that because it's got phytates in it. Don't eat this, don't eat that. Pretty much any food, Claire, you could look at and say something negative about. In one breath, I could say how, you know, carbohydrates are so important for your energy, your your thyroid health, all, all of these things. You know, I could say something negative as well refined carbohydrates can affect your blood sugar, all of this stuff. So it's all about finding balance and moderation. And I think somewhere along the line, we lost critical thinking. Right. Mm. So we lost the ability to be able to um, really analyze the information and look at the bigger picture. When we're eating food, we're not eating just one food. And so when people are scaremongering about certain, certain foods, if that's all you only ever ate for the rest of your life, then you could probably overdose on it and get mm. too much of any particular whether it's, um, you know, a nutrient or a substance that is in that food that in too much, too higher amount could be detrimental. Um, But you could also get a nutritional deficiency as well. And um, when we have everything in balance and moderation, you're not going to be getting too much of any anything. 
And so that is that is how our body is designed. Mm. We're not designed to only eat spinach or only eat meat or only eat gluten. It doesn't yeah. work like that. You know, gluten is a classic example. You know, there was a lot of scaremongering on on gluten. Now, obviously, if you're celiac, you can't have gluten. So I'm not talking about celiacs here. They they cannot have it full stop. But for most people, gluten as part of a healthy diet is absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. But there's been a lot of misinformation about gluten and the fact that, you know, people are saying, oh, gluten causes leaky gut and increased gut permeability. Now, in studies, gluten does show to increase gut permeability. And we know that when there's an increase in gut permeability, that can cause an increase in the absorption of what we call endotoxins and lipopolysaccharides and basically increase inflammation systemically within the body, right? However, that you're not just eating gluten on its own. So it's what you eat with the gluten that is very important. So if all you ate was, you know, a high gluten diet with saturated fat, ultra processed foods with a lot of emulsifiers and transglutamase and additives, a lot of preservatives, all of these things are also going to have a negative impact long term if that is all you are eating to the gut microbiome and to the lining of the gut. And yes, it could potentially cause problems and systemic inflammation and gut issues. But most people don't eat like that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, some do, I guess. But um, if you're having gluten as a you know fermented whole grain sourdough, you are getting the benefits of the fermented food. We also know that polyphenols will reduce zonulin levels. Now, gluten increases zonulin levels, which causes the increase in gut permeability. Polyphenols reduce zonulin levels. So it basically negates any negative effect of the gluten. So my point being is you can't just isolate one substance from a food and say that whole food is good or bad. It depends what other factors are in that food to determine whether it's going to have a positive effect on your health or a negative effect. And it will only have a negative effect if you eat a lot of it every day for the rest of your life, basically, or for a long period of time. So just having um, a little piece of chocolate, or if you have a little bit of processed food every day, that's likely to be absolutely fine. But if all you eat is ultra processed food, Mm -hmm. you don't get any plant foods in your diet, you're not getting whole foods in your diet, then that is not going to be a great thing on your gut or on your health. I'm also a big believer, though, Claire, as well, on your mental health as well. Mm. You know, how we think, our stress levels, that all plays a huge role on the health of ourselves as well. So it is taking that um, individual and, and looking at lifestyle factors, mental health, your your view on life, how you view life. Are you a happy person? Are you a negative person? What you put into your mouth, your stress levels, your exercise, All of that will determine health, well-being and longevity. It's not just one factor. And I've always thought when I hear people demonizing particular foods that they're not looking at it in in the context of eating a wide, varied diet, as you say, whole food based, there's a lot of cancelling out done done there and, and, and balancing and taking things in the round that is just never factored into these conversations. It's just cut this, cut that without any kind of long-term research around doing that. Exactly. And also the more you cut out of your diet, you know, when people say they have they have gut issues or, or people will have allergies or, you know, certain things happening, the more they cut out of the diet, the more they can negatively affect their gut microbiome because our gut microbiome needs diversity. Mm. Um, And we know that the studies show that the more diverse the diet, particularly plant foods in the diet, the healthier predictor um, that will be of a healthy gut microbiome. So it's all about the more we get into the diet, not too much of any one thing, but getting this diversity in, that is the best thing for the gut microbiome. And a healthy gut microbiome 
is also going to help to reduce inflammation within the body. So cutting things out is really the worst thing you can do. It's all about inclusion. And probably one of the first places I start with clients and advice, and I teach more these days, and and one of the things that um, I say is to start by including more foods in your diet. You know, at least we know 30 different plant foods a week is a good place to start. So different um, whole grains, different legumes, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, herbs, spices, getting as much diversity there as you can, rather than always having green apples or always having cashew nuts, you know, trying to mix it up, always having, you know, lentils, get the mixed beans, because different foods not only have different nutrients, but they also will contain these different phytochemicals I was talking about, and also these different prebiotics that are fuel sources for your gut microbes. And so we need that diversity. You eat a little bit of uh, meat and fish as part of your diet as well, do you? I do. I'm not a huge meat lover, so I have Uh to force myself to eat it. It's a little like me. (laughs) So I am somebody that is prone to low iron because of that. Um, But my husband will cook the meat. I can't touch it. I'm I'm a bit funny with meat. But because I am prone to low iron, I do force myself to eat it. So it is really that Mediterranean diet, really, that we know is tried and tested. And this is where, you know... People have been through the paleo diet, they've been through the carnivore diet and all these different diets that that trend and then they die off because the evidence just isn't there long term to back them up. Um, We know that the Mediterranean diet is probably has the most evidence out of all diets. Mm. And it really is the most common sense diet, right? So if you if you want to see who lives the longest, who is the healthiest, it's the people that are that are eating the Mediterranean diet, which is, you know, the plant foods, fish sort of two to three times a week, a little bit of meat product, a little bit of dairy, um, getting that diversity in the diet, extra virgin olive oil, you know, a polyphenol rich diet. That's the way to do it. You can have a little bit of alcohol, a little bit of red wine, a little bit of chocolate. You can have your coffee. Coffee is absolutely fine. It's a really good source of polyphenols. It's about um, getting that diversity, abundance of plant foods. And it's really quite simple. And as much fresh produce as you as you can, minimizing the processed food. I mean, to me, that's an obvious one. Yeah. The more ultra, ultra processed food you have, it's not alive. It's not fresh. This is just sort of highly processed food that's full of additives that really isn't great for the gut. Now, a little bit now and again really isn't going to be an issue. Mm. But if that's all you're eating, it's it's not going to be something that's going to be fueling your body with, with the right fuel. Just on that theme, I mean, I get asked about AGEs in food, which I had to go away and look up. Advanced glycation end products. Yeah. Did I say that right? Um, yeah. Harmful compounds that can form in our blood. They're linked to eating certain foods. I believe particularly those cooked at high temperatures. I mean, is that something we should be concerned about if we're eating a diet that's largely made up of these natural whole foods? Well, again, it's how much you're eating of them. So your your skin will also form them as well. So we produce these compounds, advanced glycation end products in your skin, and that's, that's what we call the glycation process in the skin that occurs with aging. So it's basically when, when sugars bind to protein and we get this, this stiffening and we get this glycation process occurring in the skin. This is also sort of happening when you cook really primarily animal produce. So when you – the typical roast lunch or roast dinner mm-hmm. um, would be, you know, advanced – glycation end product because you've got roast meat right so a roast chicken um if you think of that brown skin that's full of advanced glycation end products and that's what happens to our skin you know if we've been in the sun for too long the skin of a roast chicken and is that the same with toast you know when you slightly yeah. burn your toast yeah mm-hmm. exactly so roast potatoes burnt toast um but it's more to do with that animal products and the proteins really so it's more things like roast meat so if you're having um barbecued food all the time, char-grilled meat all the time, roast meat all the time. That's, you know, 
really well browned and, and burnt, you're going to be producing more of these advanced glycation end products. But it ultimately um, depends on how much of this you are eating and what else you have in your diet. You know, do, are you having a lot of fresh produce? Are you having a lot of brightly colored fruits and vegetables? So a little bit, your body can cope with it. But the body is a very um, advanced machine and our bodies are designed to cope with a lot of this stuff. You know, our livers are there to detoxify a lot of things that people, you know, it will detoxify alcohol. Alcohol is technically a poison. Um, let's not forget that. And what does make me laugh is, you know, quite often a lot of the people that are demonizing these compounds in food are the same people that are going out at the weekend and, you know, downing a bottle of wine or, you know, doing tequila chasers or whatever it might be. So it's about putting it all into perspective. The odd burger here and there isn't going to be harmful. But if you are eating a diet that is very high in animal produce, particularly high in meat, um, particularly high in processed meat as well, we do know that processed meat is a carcinogen. So if you're eating a lot of sausages and bacon and fried eggs and you're having that as your breakfast fry up every day and you're not having enough plant foods, that isn't going to set you up for great health. And you you would be um, shifting your body more to a pro-inflammatory diet and you, you haven't got the, the right amount of fiber and plant foods to balance out the negative effects that could potentially have on your on your health and well-being. I'm glad I asked that actually. That really clears that up for me. Thank you. Um, I want to just ask about oils as well because uh, you mentioned extra virgin olive oil and I was very confused about oils for a long time. I found it all a bit complicated and so I really sort of just settled on that. That's primarily what I, I cook with and use in my dressings and all the rest of it. Um, and then, of course, you hear someone saying, oh, well, you've got to watch with that because if that gets to smoking point, it actually becomes harmful for you. And then there my head goes, start spinning again. Where this confusion came was I think the smoke point on extra virgin olive oil is, is lower. And so um, when an oil has a low smoke point, it means that it can oxidize and then form harmful compounds, which is where the scaremongering comes from. The thing with the extra virgin olive oil, however, though, it is really high in polyphenols and antioxidants. So the smoke point is kind of irrelevant because when you're cooking with extra virgin olive oil, the antioxidants and the polyphenol content in the extra virgin olive oil, and this is why extra virgin olive oil is the important one to get. Okay. Because it's high it's higher in these polyphenols and antioxidants, they will negate any oxidation from the cooking process. Yeah, so it's kind of offsetting. Again, so it's all about, you know, the bigger picture. Yeah. So that the healthiest oil to cook with still is extra virgin olive oil. Okay. So you can cook with it, you can roast with it, you can, you can have it, obviously if you have it raw, yeah. you're going to have more of the polyphenol benefit. Yeah. And they've even had studies, I think it was something like 30 grams of a day, but don't quote me on that. I'll have to double check that mm -hmm. um, for the, the polyphenol um, content was, was having additional health benefits on that. So um, mm -hmm. extra virgin olive oil is my oil of choice to cook with. And any oil really is going to, to oxidize the more the longer you cook with it. And so you yeah. never want to reuse cooking oil either. You don't want to cook with it and then reuse that that oil that you cook with and cook it again because that's when it's, it's not going to be healthy. Do you recommend supplements? I, I had just uh, covered on the channel that there was, I guess a surprising really, but major study uh, from the National Cancer Institute in the US. I mean, they looked at, at uh, 400,000 people over 20 years and found that taking a daily multivitamin, didn't add any years to life. There was a possible, it was so small, it's probably not statistically relevant, but it, it possibly had a negative effect in the end for some people. What's your view on supplementing? Because, you know, there's my mum right next door. She has a vitamin B12 shot every every six weeks. It saves her life, you know. I mean, there are obviously some things, and, and, and we talk about vitamin D as well. I mean, where do you stand on, on supplementing? I think I'm standing exactly aligned with with where you're at on it to be mm -hmm. honest and i've always been a little bit controversial in what i've said about supplementation because you know i've got a i've got a supplement company that i develop mm -hmm. product um 
And one of the things, and one of the reasons I, I did that was because I'm not a believer in taking synthetic multivitamins daily for the very reasons that, that you have said. Um, we, we know that there's no particular benefit for doing that. Also, when you take isolated high dose synthetic vitamins, um, it's going to have a knock on effect to the biochemistry of the body. So you can knock out other nutrients or raise the requirement mm. for other nutrients in higher amounts. And your body isn't designed to work off synthetic vitamins. And if we go back to what I was saying earlier, when we get our nutrients from whole foods and plant foods, not only are we getting vitamins and minerals in much lower amounts, but I'm a believer that we're meant to have these lower amounts because they're all working in synergy and in, in harmony. Nothing's then going to be blocking anything. But we're also getting these phytochemicals or phytonutrients that I was talking about that help to activate these biochemical responses within the body to help activate your own cellular defense mechanisms. So to put that into perspective, if we're getting these phytonutrients from plant foods, we can activate our own cellular defenses without the need for relying on an external high dose antioxidant. And studies have shown, Claire, that I think it was even a thousand milligrams of um, synthetic vitamin C can downregulate your cell's own ability to produce its own antioxidants like superoxide dismutase and, and glutathione, which if you actually think about it, makes a lot of sense. Because I say, um, you know, if you've got someone always doing your washing, cooking, cleaning and ironing, and then that person goes on holiday, you don't know how to turn the... Um, washing machine on or you don't know how to start the dishwasher and yeah. your body's the same if you're constantly supplying external sources the body doesn't then have to work for itself and produce its own antioxidants so that was you know one of the reasons i i started my supplement company was it's all natural nutrition it's all from plant foods it's not synthetic vitamins in mm -hmm. there um so to support the body if you're not getting enough greens in your diet or enough red foods um to support it that way and to get the prebiotics in and do it as naturally as possible. So that is my viewpoint. You're best not to take a synthetic vitamin um, and try and do it as naturally as possible. Unless, however, you are prone to a nutritional deficiency for whatever reason that may be. Maybe it's because you just don't eat enough red meat or um, you're not getting enough iron or maybe it is because of the aging process, we don't absorb certain nutrients as well. So after the age of 60, most people would need to supplement with something like a B12 or, a, or make sure they're getting enough of the B vitamins. Mm. So there is definitely a time and a place for supplementation. But what I'm not pro is just going out and buying a random multivitamin or mm, I think I'll need, I need some iron, so I'll go and buy an iron supplement, which can actually be very toxic in high doses if you don't need it. We also can overdose on B vitamins. It can cause um, nerve damage if you're getting too much vitamin B6. So if you're taking a B vitamin supplement and you don't need it, and then you're taking a multivitamin and that's got Bs, and then you're getting Bs through your diet as well, you could overdose because the, the vitamins, synthetic vitamins added in most supplements are in way higher doses than what you would naturally get in food. So I always say there is a time and a place for supplementation and some people will need supplements, but don't just randomly take a supplement for no reason because there are that is to say that um, in some cases they can actually do more, more harm than good. That is serious. I was going to say food for thought, supplements for thought. Um, yeah, and obviously alongside testing, you know, uh, finding out where your nutritional levels currently lie and not doing a kind of um, just sort of shot in the dark of, of what you take. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, something like vitamin D, probably particularly in the UK, you would need to supplement. Yeah. Yeah, even the government here says everybody should be taking a supplement, and I could I could uh, vouch for the difference that it has made to me in winter. Absolutely, 
you know, and if you're not getting enough vitamin D, it's going to affect your immune system. It can affect your, your bones. It will affect your mood as well. You know, one of the first signs of low vitamin D will be a very uh, flat mood. You know, you just feel flat, not excited, a um, little bit tearful. So I'm not anti-supplements. What I'm anti is just randomly taking some multivitamin or thinking you can eat anything and then just pop a vitamin pill. I'm about, you know, whole foods, um, supporting the gut microbiome and then supplementing if necessary. I wanted to ask you all about skin, but I am now thinking if you would be willing, Fiona, at some point to come back, we could have a separate conversation about skin flammaging and your whole uh, you know, school of thought around skin and, and how you approach that. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, I would love to because, you know, I've sort of worked hands-on in skin. I've also seen, you know, people using too many ingredients, too many skin products, um, too many skin treatments can, I believe, do more damage than good. And, I, you know, firsthand I've, I've had disasters on my own skin from having, you know, skin tightening treatments and things like that. So there's definitely um, one we can talk about. Right. I am looking forward to that already. I, I want to have it tomorrow, but I'll give you some time. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, people do too much. Same with, we, we take everything with it, you know, extremes. And it's about, you know, that critical thinking and, and looking at the bigger picture. And skincare is very, I have a very similar approach to skincare as I do with, with nutrition. And yeah. a lot of it is, is common sense. Okay, I'm looking forward to that one. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, you know, isn't technology amazing? Because I remember 10 years ago, trying to have a video call with a friend who moved to Australia and it was like, zzz, zzz. it was like she was in outer space and, and here we are able to chat away, it's brilliant. It's amazing technology and you could be anywhere right now. I can't believe you're on the other side of the world. I know, I know. Okay, well, you have a lovely evening and I'll get on the, with the rest of the day and you take care, it's great to see you. Thanks, Claire. Well, I hope you found that conversation as reassuring as I did. And I'm going to link in the description to other helpful discussions around nutrition and supplements that I think you might enjoy, along with some further information about Fiona. You'll also find in the description options for listening to the show on the go through YouTube Music, Apple or Spotify. And don't forget, you can find more advice from me around how to age well on my website, honest.scot. And by scrolling down to the bottom of any page, you can subscribe to my monthly newsletter where I round up all my latest content so you don't miss a thing. But for now, thank you for being here today and I hope to see you next time. Bye.